Hello and welcome to Sickle Cell Disease. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's talk a little bit about what sickle cell disease is and a sickle cell crisis might look like. These are some normal looking red blood cells. So the appearance is going to be round, they're going to be flexible so they can squeeze on through those tiny little capillaries. They'll be rich in hemoglobin so that they're able to carry oxygen to the tissues. So the illustration here is showing that process by which we are developing oxyhemoglobin and then releasing that oxygen at the tissue level. Hemoglobin also acts as a buffer in acid-base balance, so it has that additional component that's helpful. However, we have situations where patients will have what's called hemoglobin S. And in hemoglobin S, they will have a normal-looking round appearance when they're oxygenated. So they'll be normal-looking and they may completely function as normal red blood cells. However, when they're oxygen deprived or when there's dehydration, they will become stiff and they will sickle. So they can carry oxygen when they are not sickled, but once these cells sickle, they're no longer able to carry out the normal functions of hemoglobin, being oxygen carrying capacity and buffering our pH in our body. Sickle cell disease and it comprises this entire process here. So it's a group of disorders that include sickle cell anemia and sickle cell trait. So it's kind of encompassing the whole thing. Sickle cell anemia is an active disease where our red blood cells are actively sickling. We'll have periods of crisis where we have sickling as a result of dehydration or hypoxemia. And then we'll have periods where there's fairly normal function of the red blood cells. Sickle cell trait, there's no active disease. However, that patient has the trait for sickle cell and can pass the disease on to offspring. So let's take a look at what's happening here with a cell that is sickling. On the left-hand side, we have an illustration of what might be a normal red blood cell. So it's round, and it has all these little hemoglobins in it, so the little red dots are the hemoglobins. Uh, so we have a nice, normal-looking red blood cell that's going to move through the circulation, carrying oxygen to the tissues. However, what happens in a cell that has sickled is that the hemoglobin will line up, like in a straight line, and it will bind together. The bind is irreversible. So once the cell has sickled, it's going to remain sickled, and that cell is just going to die. It's going to be removed by the spleen, and we're going to get rid of it out of the body. But it's done. It's, it's no longer an effective cell that could be used in the body for any kind of bodily function. The other uh, disadvantage of having this sickled cell is that it's no longer flexible. Now it's stiff, and you see it's got a crescent-type shape. So it's likely to get stuck in the circulation, causing those periods of acute crisis where we have lots of pain. The pain is coming from the sickle cells blocking the circulation and causing ischemia. So risk factors for developing a sickle cell crisis include dehydration, stress, exercise, infection, fever. Wow, doesn't it sound like every patient in the hospital? Yeah, because we all, all our patients in the hospital have got some kind of a risk factor here for having a sickle cell crisis. So if your patient has a history of sickle cell disease, we want to be watching for and trying to avoid these risk factors, specifically avoiding hypoxia and dehydration. On the right-hand side, you notice this chart. It's showing the process that occurs in sickle cell crisis, where we have hypoxemia, we have dehydration causing sickling, then there's a distortion of the membrane, uh, not only of the red blood cell itself, but also of the vasculature. The red blood cell becomes more sticky than normal, and then we get hemolysis. Of course, uh, we're going to start breaking those red blood cells down and taking them away since they're no longer helpful. But we also get vaso-occlusion of those sickled cells that are sticking in those small capillaries and then causing pain. 
So symptom-wise, you would anticipate pain being kind of the number one, right? So bone crisis, this is a very common type of uh, presentation for patients who have sickle cell disease. They get long bone pain or maybe stiff, painful joints. So the bone crisis or the joint crisis, very common presentation in sickle cell disease. We can also have an abdominal crisis. It's a sudden, constant abdominal pain, usually not associated with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So it's not something that's happening in the GI system. It's something happening to the GI system. And basically what's happening in an abdominal crisis is that we're having a bowel infarction. So obviously we would have sudden constant abdominal pain. Jaundice, bruising, blood in the urine may also occur with any of these different types of crisis. In the same way that these sickled cells are blocking vessels peripherally, they could also be blocking vessels around the heart, and we can have an acute chest syndrome. That is chest pain associated with dyspnea, tachycardia, bloody sputum, and pulmonary fibrosis. This would be treated a little differently than other types of acute chest syndrome in that we want to try to increase our fluid volume so that we're washing these sickled cells through and maintaining oxygen and possibly even giving supplemental oxygen even if the oxygen saturation looks okay. So management, if it's hypoxia that's causing the problem, then we want to give oxygen, right? Fluids, okay, if dehydration is the problem, we want to give fluids. So fluids and oxygen, that's our primary treatments here for our sickle cell crisis. Folic acid, hydrea, pain control is very important. Okay, these patients can have severe pain with a sickle cell crisis. Transfusion in some cases, especially if the patient has a lot of sickled cells or if the patient is very anemic. The anemia part happens here because the spleen, which is pictured on the right, the spleen is going to work on removing our red blood cells that are no longer functional. So if we have red blood cells that are not doing their job, like sickled red blood cells, they're going to go down to the spleen and the spleen is going to break them down and remove them. So in that situation, if we have a significant amount of red blood cells that are being homolysized and removed from the body, then we're going to need to have transfusion. Complications include renal dysfunction, so we're clogging up the kidneys with having all of these uh, sickled cells in there, stroke, blindness, infection, okay, the, the spleen starts to become clogged up with sickled cells and can no longer function as it should. One of the functions of the spleen was preventing infection. So we may have an increase in the infection rate in our patient because the spleen is no longer able to do its job. Well, thank you for joining me for Sickle Cell Disease. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time, bye now.